David and I are again very, very pleased to be able to be with you this afternoon. Our topic this afternoon is on the gift of the spirit of prophecy. For those of you who are maybe not some of the Adventists, some of the Adventist church believes that Ellen G. White was given the gift of prophecy. She lived approximately a little over 100, about 100 years ago is when she passed away, but had a long ministry of many, many decades, wrote many, many books. And what we're going to be focusing on this afternoon are the statements that she made relative to creation, the flood, the age of the earth, and the universe. So, with that beginning, we're going to go the Sabbath creation of the heavens. This is from her Testimonies, Volume 2, page 583. David? He set apart that special day for man to rest from his labor, that, as he should look upon the earth beneath and the heavens above, he might reflect that God made all these in six days and rested upon the seventh, and that as he should behold the tangible proofs of God's infinite wisdom, his heart might be filled with love and reverence for his maker. David, that's a very powerful statement, isn't it? As man should look on the earth beneath and the heavens above, he should see that indeed God made all these in six days and rested upon the seventh. That's why this is what we understand to be another correlation with the biblical record there in the fourth commandment. Right. But it's written out in a little different English, but everything we can look. And of course, we use Hubble Space Telescope, and we see the glories of the heavens. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 50 says, Adam and Eve were visited by angels and were granted communion with their maker, with no obstructing veil between. The mysteries of the visible universe, the wondrous works of him which is perfect in knowledge, afforded them an exhaustless source of instruction and delight. David, we've got these words, visible universe, underlined for a reason, and that is Adam and Eve were having access, as you pointed out this morning, to the visible universe, what we can see with our eyes and with the Hubble Space Telescope. That's the visible universe. And then, of course, there is the other the pre-creation, so to speak, existed who knows how long, and it's the outer galactic shell, but this afternoon we're going to focus primarily on the visible universe. Good. We've talked about some of these before, but we're going to do it all the, together this afternoon again, even though we're going to have a few repetitions, because there's a cohesive whole that we believe is communicated by going through the whole program. Psalm 68, 32 and 33, we saw this in other versions the, earlier this morning. But now from the King James Version, Sing unto God, ye kingdoms of the earth, O sing praises unto the Lord, to him that rideth upon the heavens of heavens, which were of old. And we want to contrast that of old, to him who rides on the heaven of heavens, which were of old, to him who rides the ancient skies above, who thunders with a mighty voice, that indeed the Bible is speaking in part on these ancient heavens, or the heavens that were of old, prior, we believe, to the six-day creation. Sing, O God, O kingdoms of the earth, sing praises to the Lord, Selah, to him who rides the heavens, in the heavens, the ancient heavens, sing to God, O kingdoms of the earth, sing praises to the Lord, to him who rides upon, again, the highest heavens, which are from ancient times, something that we also quoted this morning. And I saw a new heaven, and by the way, you can see, of course, that we're not only referring to the writings of Ellen G. White, we're also making reference to the Bible in these instances to see if there isn't this correlation that we can easily discern between what the Bible says on a topic and also from the writings of Ellen G. White, Spirit of Prophecy. I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth where it passed away, there was no more sea. So what we see now today in Hubble Space Telescope is sooner or later going to be replaced by a new heaven and a new earth. And we're going to find out there's some interesting things that are going to be observable in this new heavens and the new earth. Now, David, we have focused, and you especially have brought out the difference between what scientists believe and what we're doing here and what we believe as far as the Bible is concerned. God and the laws of nature, I've always been fascinated by this quotation. Yet men of science think 
that they can comprehend the wisdom of God, that which he has done or can do. The idea largely prevails that he is restricted by his own laws. Men either deny or ignore his existence or think to explain everything, even the operation of his spirit upon the human heart. And they no longer reverence his name or fear his power. They do not believe in the supernatural, not understanding God's laws or his infinite power to work his will through them. As commonly used, the term laws of nature comprises what men have been able to discover with regard to the laws that govern the physical world. But how limited is their knowledge and how vast the field in which the Creator can work in harmony with his own laws and yet wholly beyond the comprehension of finite beings. You know, David, as you read that, what occurs to me is <clears throat> the universe being as vast as it is, billions of light years away to the most distant galaxies, and astronomers telling everybody, well, you know, these had to have been created or formed billions and billions of years ago. Uh, and here it tells us, of course, this is a lot of just nonsense in terms of what God can do with the physical laws. And as we said this morning, of course, we know there is this extra dimension of space-time where God is working where we have no access to at the present time. The stoning of Stephen and the speed of light, and this is, uh, I want to bring out something relative to that, so go ahead. From Acts 7, verses 55 and 56. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Let's think about that just for a moment. Here we have Stephen, and it says, the heavens open. This was not then, we wouldn't say that would be a vision. I mean, this is Stephen looking up, and he sees the heavens open. Something is opening up, and there is Jesus standing at the right hand of the throne of God. Okay. And after six days, Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John, and leadeth them up into an high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can white them. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, that, This is my beloved Son. Hear him. It's from Mark 9, verse 2, 3, and 7. Now, David, we're going to continue to look at this in just a minute, but here again, as with the stoning of Stephen, Stephen looking up, and light actually came from the throne. What? Instantly, almost. And so we have, you know, when God wills, then light moves, so to speak, far more rapidly than we can explain by normal physical laws. And the same thing here in the Mount of Transfiguration. Go ahead. There's something interesting, very, very interesting here, David. Only the three who are to witness his anguish in Gethsemane have been chosen to be with him on the mount. Now the burden of his prayer is that they may be given a manifestation of the glory he had with the Father before the world was. His prayer is heard. While he is bowed in lowliness upon the stony ground, suddenly the heavens open, the golden gates of the city of God are thrown wide, and holy radiance descends upon the mount, enshrouding the Savior's form. Divinity from within flashes through humanity and meets the glory coming from above. Arising from his prostate position, Christ stands in godlike majesty. The soul agony is gone. His countenance now shines as the sun, and his garments are white as the light. You know, what is so intriguing about these passages that in the bowl there in the end, while he is bowed in lowliness, suddenly the heavens open, and it says the golden gates of the city of God are thrown wide. In other words, in order for the light to go through, the gates of the city had to be open. A real physical effect, real light coming from the throne of God beyond Orion in an instant of time. Radiance descending upon him and Gloria from Christ himself meeting that which comes from above. So again, with respect to the speed of light, holy inhabitants of other worlds. Go ahead, David. Now, this is something again that is so interesting from our standpoint, it tells us 
you know, this afternoon, who knows how many hundreds or thousands or who knows how many, go ahead, of the other worlds. The holy inhabitants of other worlds were watching with deepest interest the events taking place on the earth. In the condition of the world that existed before the flood, they saw illustrated the results of the administration which Lucifer had endeavored to establish in heaven. In rejecting the authority of Christ and casting aside the law of God. To the angels and the unfallen worlds, the cry, it is finished, had a deep significance. It was for them, as well as for us, that the great work of redemption had been accomplished. I advanced a little too quickly there. I want us to go back to this just a minute, because here we have the holy inhabitants of other worlds. The other worlds are scattered throughout the universe. Billions of light years away in these other galaxies in some cases. And yet they are what? Looking, taking interest in exactly what's happening in real time. That's basically what is being said here. Can you imagine that? We've got earthly television. This is cosmic television coming through this extra dimension in the universe. And again, the unfallen worlds cry, not only to the angels, but the unfallen worlds, billions and billions of light years away. It is finished. They heard it. They saw it. Had a deep significance. So we've got people watching us. Who knows how many this afternoon on the other world? Satan led men into sin, and the plan of redemption was put in operation. For 4,000 years, Christ was working for man's uplifting, and Satan for his ruin and degradation. And the heavenly universe beheld it all. From <clears throat> Desire of Ages, page 759. Of course, this is one of many, many, many references in the spirit of prophecy which actually put a time frame on the span length, the span between creation and the time of Jesus um, when he was here on earth. There's several 4,000 year um, statements and again of course there's many 6,000 year statements as well but I think um, in, in a discussion I had recently with someone about this particular topic. Uh, if, you, um, if you want to think of a scenario that would have um, the statements of Ellen White being approximate or things like that, it would be hard to place these statements in that category. Because she says it so many times in so many different ways, 4,000 years between creation and the time of Jesus, 6,000 years for the length of time of the great controversy itself, um, that you really have to um, consider carefully that the age of the earth is approximately 6,000 years old, and that the time between creation and the time of Jesus is approximately 4,000 years. Early Writings, page 16. The 144,000 shouted, Alleluia, as they recognized their friends who had been torn from them by death. And in the same moment, we were changed and caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. We all entered the cloud together and were seven days ascending to the sea of glass when Jesus brought the crowns and with his own right hand placed them on our heads. Of course, anybody can tell you that seven days, you know, traveling even at the speed of light would uh, barely get you, you know, a fraction of the distance to the, even to the closest star, which is only, you know, aside from the sun. Um, but the closest stars, I think, only, you know, about four, four years um, traveling, four years away traveling at the speed of light. So if you're only going to be traveling seven days at the speed of light, uh, you know, we're traveling fairly rapidly. Let's, let's explore that just a minute. Seven days, to me, my view is, Jesus is going to take the redeemed in a whirlwind cosmic tour, who knows how far in the universe, but guess what? We'll be going, the redeemed will be going, and Jesus is leading these people, us, hopefully, millions of times, in a sense, faster than the speed of light. Whiz, 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 this galaxy, let's go here, let's go there. Show us the glories of the universe. Will that not be a trip to look forward to? Fantastic, fantastic. We look, you know, things in this world happening rapidly. Nothing compared to what 
we're going to be traveling in this, I believe, this other dimension, so to speak, but yet we'll see the galaxies. Guess what? As we whiz by a galaxy, let your imagination uh, just expand just for a moment, and Jesus comes close to one of these unfallen worlds, and Jesus says, hello, everybody, and they start waving and waving and waving, and Jesus has got this huge, huge group of the redeemed being raised and taken to Orion, well, beyond Orion, and of course, They've already gone through Orion and circling the universe. But he takes them past these worlds, and the people in these worlds see and know when Jesus is coming, and they see these people. And we start, they wave at us, and we start waving at them. And we say, we don't know you, but we hope to get acquainted with you here in the next million years or so. I mean, there are millions, billions, a trillion galaxies, and hundreds of thousands of worlds in each galaxy. There's an untold number, vast number of people in the universe that we all look forward to what? Meeting, and guess what? They're going to want to, you know, the Bible says, ye are my witnesses. God's plan is for us to be witnesses for him throughout the universe to the unfallen worlds. They want to sit down and talk to us and say, look, we saw you going through this and this and this and this. Give us a better understanding of basically all the things that were going through your minds. That's my, my view when I read those words like when we, this. When we pass by the Ant Nebula, We'll have seen it, we'll say, oh, we saw that on the slideshow at the Corona Church about, you know, however many years ago it was. I recognize that. And somebody in the unfallen world would say, yeah, we saw you doing it too. <laughs> Patriarchs and Prophets, page 41. Lucifer, as the anointed cherub, had been highly exalted. He was greatly loved by the heavenly beings, and his influence over them was strong. God's government included not only the inhabitants of heaven, but of all the worlds that he had created. And Lucifer had concluded that if he could carry the angels of heaven with him in rebellion, he could carry also all the worlds. So again, a reference to the fact that indeed there were un, there unfallen worlds, unfallen beings who existed we don't know how long before the actual creation of earth and the universe as we know. Go ahead. The king of the universe summoned the heavenly host before him that in their presence he might set forth the true position of his son and show the relation he sustained to all created beings. The son of God shared the father's throne and the glory of the eternal self-existent one encircled both. About the throne gathered the holy angels, a vast unnumbered throng, 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands the most exalted angels as ministers and subjects rejoicing in the light that fell upon them from the presence of the deity. Before the assembled inhabitants of heaven, the king declared that none but Christ, the only begotten of God, could fully enter into his purposes. And to him it was committed to execute the mighty counsels of his will. The Son of God had wrought the Father's will in the creation of all the hosts of heaven. And to him, as well as to God, their homage and allegiance were due. Christ was still to exercise divine power in the creation of the earth and its inhabitants. But in all this, he would not seek power or exaltation for himself, contrary to God's plan, but would exalt the Father's glory and execute his purposes of beneficence and love. So we here see this clear distinction, the worlds that existed, and then Christ was still to exercise divine power in the creation of the earth and its inhabitants, us, David, in, as the great controversy expands, Revelation 12, 7 through 9, gives a very vivid picture of the action in heaven that occurred at the time of Satan's rebellion. And it describes it very clearly. It says, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. <clears throat> And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I saw that when God said to his son, this is from Spiritual Gifts, volume 1, page 17, and I saw that when God said to his son, let us make man in our image, Satan was jealous of Jesus. He wished to be highest in heaven, next to God, and receive highest honors. Until this time, all heaven was in order, harmony, and perfect subjection to the government of God. David, this has an element of a time period, time frame, that in my view is absolutely fascinating. 
because it says that indeed, essentially, that whereas Lucifer may have been jealous for a long time and so forth, when God said, let us make man in our image, when was that? Creation week. What day of creation week? The sixth day. So on day six of creation week, Satan was jealous. He wished to have the highest honor received until this time, until this time, sixth day of creation week, all was in order, harmony, and perfect suggestion to the government of God. But when God said, let us make man in our image, explosion, right about this, you know, it's difficult for us as human beings to think that things would develop that quickly. But this is heaven. I mean, these beings are perfect and they move with this, they move truly with the speed of light. So once, this is not to say that Lucifer's rebellion was not in the process of developing a long time before that, but that was a culminating factor. You find that interesting that indeed six day of creation week, that this is when it all sort of blew apart? I find it very interesting. From the story of redemption, page 19, this kind of mirrors what we just read in uh, Revelation 12. Then there was war in heaven. Angels in heaven mourned the fate of those who had been their companions in happiness and bliss. Their loss was felt in heaven. The father consulted his son in regard to at once carrying out their purpose to make man to inhabit the earth. So it almost sounds like that with the war in heaven, with the casting out of Satan, nevertheless, even, even with all of this um, disruption, the plan to carry out at once the purpose to make man inhabit the earth was still fulfilled. So there's, you know, there's at least an indication that possibly these things happened during creation week, possibly on day six of creation week. What we just saw was, you know, that it was when God said, let us make man in our image, that's when the explosion, so to speak, Lucifer said, I've had enough, and brought his views there, and everybody made their decision. He was cast out, there was war. It was not a long, drawn-out war. It was over, who knows, maybe in five minutes. I mean, you know, you've got Jesus Christ leading the charge, and Jesus is God, so he could wipe out and you know, push those guys out of heaven. The loyal angel, I mean, the angels that had been loyal for who knows how long, Jesus, we're told, was the instructor of all these angels, and all of a sudden they're going to turn against him, turn against the Father in heaven, and just because Lucifer wanted the first rank there, all right, so let us make man in our image, explosion. Lucifer says, I want it, and John says, if you want it, get out. And then immediately, Father consults his son in regard, as you said, at once carrying out their purpose to make man inhabit the earth. So it had, that still had to be day six. A lot happened on day six of creation week, especially in heaven. And then Adam and Eve and all the sort of things that had to be done. So anyway, go ahead. The laws and operations of nature which have engaged men's study for 6,000 years. There's another one of the statements that refers to 6,000 years. The laws, of operation in the laws and operations of nature which have engaged men's study for 6,000 years were opened to their minds by the infinite framer and upholder of all. God's glory in the heavens, the innumerable worlds in their orderly revolutions. That gives you a little clue as to perhaps how the universe is ordered. The balancings of the clouds, the mysteries of light and sound, of day and night, all were open to the study of our first parents. Yeah, again, it says, I'm engaged in men's study for 6,000 years. That's pretty plain, plain isn't it? Yeah. All right, sun, stars, and circle, God shown. Now, this is going to be in the days ahead. This is at the end of the 1,000 years. Go ahead. All the treasures of the universe will be open to the study of God's redeemed. Unfettered by mortality, they winged their tireless flight to worlds afar, worlds that thrilled with sorrow at the spectacle of human woe and rang with songs of gladness at the tidings of a ransomed soul. With unutterable delight, the children of earth enter into the joy and wisdom of unfallen beings. Let's stop there again. Uh, we've got these words here, unfettered by mortality. They wing their tireless light to worlds afar, worlds that thrill with sorrow at the spectacle of human woe. Songs 
and rang with the songs of gladness. That means, we might as well face it, that means that God intends people from this world, us, the redeemed, to actually travel to these unfallen worlds, and those people apparently will not have, as far as I can tell, they don't have the ability to zip around the universe as do the angels. The redeemed are going to have to go there, and we appreciate this opportunity of being with you today. Thought just occurred to me, David. But you had to take an airplane out here, didn't you? I sure did. <laughs> okay. But just checking. Thought just occurred to me, you know? Some of those worlds, at least one or two of them, who knows how many people are watching this afternoon, David, in our program here. You think there's a possibility. Now, we've never discussed this in our entire lives. It thought just now occurred to me, but I'm going to ask you a question oh, on no. the spot. <laughs> I'm, ask you. I'm scared now. <laughs> Do you think there's a possibility, just a possibility, that some of those people who are watching this afternoon are going to invite us back in one of these unfallen worlds and say, look, folks, look, Bob and David, we, we got some of what you were saying down there in planet Earth. Uh, you know, who knows how long ago. But, you know, you've been around to so many worlds, we're just, you're just not catching up to us. We don't, we're out here somewhere. You think that we're going to be invited to go back and give another a creation seminar? and tell how things developed here in this world. They would have seen us, but you know, they never met us. Now, what oh, do you think about probably that? not. <laughs> what did you say? I said, probably not. <laughs> probably not. <laughs> okay, I'm supposed to say yes. Okay, yes. <laughs> All right, that's good. You know what? I was going to say, oh, ye of little faith. But now that you said yes, okay. great faith. That's how serious, this is how serious, this is how realistic all this is. It's right on the near horizon. Not only David and I, but every person here, every one of God's redeemed is going to have a story to tell, and the unfallen worlds, unquestionably, are going to want to interview personally everyone here that's been in the redeemed, all the redeemed of all ages. They're going to want to interview. I just happened to bring out David and I. This occurred to me here while we were speaking this afternoon and reading these passages. But go ahead. We've already... Um, yeah, go ahead. The most dangerous thoughts are the ones that he has during a presentation. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Great Controversy, page 676. They share the treasures of knowledge and understanding gained through ages upon ages in contemplation of God's handiwork. With undimmed vision, they gaze upon the glory of creation, suns and stars and systems, all in their appointed order, what? Circling the throne of deity. Circling the throne of deity. So it sounds like that at least at this time, there is going to be an order to the universe, and that order is going to be centered on the throne of God. Now that makes sense, doesn't it? If you read Revelation, you see the new Jerusalem is going to come down to earth. So at some point in the future, earth truly will be what? The center of the universe. The exact center of the universe. I don't necessarily believe that it's the center of the universe now, but astronomically speaking, we didn't really talk about this, this today during church, but astronomically speaking, Earth is close to the center of the universe. That's why Hubble, when he was standing up here on Mount Wilson, smoking his pipe and looking out at the galaxies, decided that Earth was, you know, at the center of some type of an expansion. Maybe not right at the exact center, but maybe, we're, maybe the center is within or near or close to this galaxy. But at the time of the new earth, after the new Jerusalem comes down to this earth, I promise you at that point, suns and stars and systems all in their appointed order, circling the throne of deity. Upon all things, from the least to the greatest, the Creator's name is written and in all are the riches of his power displayed. At some point, Ptolemy's dream will be true. <laughs> the know, sun will rotate around the earth. That's right. You know, as you were reading this, um, it occurred to me, this is going to be a part of the new heavens and the new earth. Right now, the galaxies are expanding, expanding. away. 
to where God wanted to show the world here there he was at the center of the universe and how can you do that except this expansion but then as you say circling the throne of deity and as you say God's throne will be moved to the earth and so it stands to reason God's throne is the center now God's throne is going to be the center then oh these are thoughts you know that make us come alive Patriarchs and Prophets, page 115. Thou, even thou, art Lord alone. Thou hast made heaven the heaven of heavens with all their host, the earth, and all things therein, and thou preservest them all. Nehemiah 9, 6. As regards this world, God's work of creation is completed, for the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Hebrews 4, 3. But his energy is still exerted in upholding the objects of his creation. So we're not in active creation anymore, but God is still using his creative energy to uphold what he has already created. Well, we know, of course, the new the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of God, that's one of the heavens. Then there is this heavens that existed prior, of course, to the creation of this present heavens. So the heaven of heavens refers, of course, to the throne of God, the heaven there, the city of God, and so forth. So anyway, the Bible is giving us a snapshot of basically what it's all about in terms of the universe. Behold, the heavens, and the heavens of heavens is the Lord thy God, the earth, and also that, is, that therein is. Separating out, helping us to understand that indeed the heavens we see are going to be different, are different at the present time, then the heaven of heavens could include, of course, the New Jerusalem and this outer ring, spherical shell of galaxies, which we got a chance to at least mention this particular morning. I knew a man in Christ, Paul says, about 14 years ago, he's talking of himself, whether in the body or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth such a one caught up into the third heaven. And of course, we know that means the city of God. Paul was taken to the throne and there, of course, was a given this tremendous first-hand tour, so to speak, of the city. We don't know all that went on, but other places in the Bible, he said, it's not even lawful for me to tell what I saw. That's how much sacredness is involved in what was shown to me at that time. Thus says God the Lord, he then created the heavens and again stretched them out. I made the earth, created man upon it, I, even my hands, have stretched out the heavens and all their hosts have I commanded. You know, what occurs to me is that when Hubble was making those observations and saw this clear evidence that indeed things were expanding from the earth, if he had picked up the Bible and read it, this whole chapter of Isaiah, 5, 10, 12, 13 passages here, refers to this stretching out. In other words, folks, what we're saying is, if there had been, where were the Seventh-day Adventists? Back in the days of 1929, Hubble and the other astronomers decided, of course, you know, look, we're going to make everything vanish here as far as the center. Why wasn't there someone standing up and saying, look, everyone, Edwin Hubble has made the most fantastic discovery you can ever imagine. Center of the universe. Can you imagine what kind of evangelistic information would have been given to this world, how many people would have turned to Christ if the leaders of the astronomical community had said, look, we have found something that relates to God. David? Isaiah 40, 22. It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. God really wants us to understand by this repetition that this stretching out of the heavens is very, very meaningful. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it, he created it not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, there is none else. And again, there's a passage there that really caught my attention, David, with respect to this whole issue of age of the earth and things like that, long, long period of time. It says there, does it not? He created it not in vain, he formed it to be what? Inhabited. Inhabited. Doesn't that mean that indeed there was a correspondence, as we well know from the other passages we read, there was a correspondence between the earth and the inhabitants. Created the earth to be what? Inhabited, and that's exactly what happened just in day six. So 
By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. There's some other, this is the biblical text, of course, but there's something fascinating that we're going to find here in just a few minutes as we continue. David? Yeah, from manuscript 73, page 238, from year 1886. When we returned at midnight, the same scenes continued, but for all the hundreds of stars across the heavens, we could not miss one. Not a single glory in the starry host seemed to be missing. The following nights we had no such scene repeated. God's host still shines in the firmament of the heavens. Ellen White was out there a night, when, a night, of course, when there were, quote, falling stars, meteors coming down, and beautiful, beautiful, beautiful sight. And then she's saying the next night, of course, she equates these falling stars, so to speak, with God's host says, God's host still shines in the firmament of the heavens. The stars are still there, in spite of the fact that she was seeing this meteorite shower to a great extent. So the equating then of the God's host with the starry heavens is basically what this is all about. Amen. Review and Herald, October 27, 1885. Mm -hmm. He who laid the foundation of the earth, who garnished the heavens and marshaled the stars in their order. He who has clothed the earth would have his children appreciate his works. David, it says, marshal the stars in their order. You know, one of the things that happened when made Hubble's discovery so tremendous was that, of course, when Copernicus made the discovery that indeed planets and everything were encircling the sun, there was the first time for sure that it was known that indeed there was order here in the planetary system. The Ptolemaic theory, of course, was a fake, but nevertheless people thought there was order then. But for sure, when Copernicus came along and described, of course, the planetary motion about the sun, it was known there was order in the solar system. But when Hubble made his discovery that indeed there's something in the universe, that raised the issue. We have to understand beyond and above everything that Hubble was thinking about, Back in, I think, the late 1700s, there was a man by the name of Napoleon Bonaparte. I'm sure we all know of him. Napoleon Bonaparte had a very good friend, and his friend was one of the greatest mathematicians that lived in the Middle Ages. Laplace, Joseph Laplace, Simon Laplace. He had written a treatise about the planetary motions uh, some 50 or 100 years or so after Copernicus made the discovery using mathematics, using calculus, and so forth, and differential equations. And in the process of doing that, Laplace was a very good friend of Napoleon de Bonaparte, and he gave Bonaparte a copy of his treatise on celestial mechanics. Of course, it was all mathematics, but nevertheless, uh, Bonaparte read through it. And he said, there's one problem I see in all of this. He said to Laplace, where is God? And Laplace said, I have no need of this hypothesis. That laid the foundation for modern astronomy and modern scientists to begin to diverge widely from the Bible. We have no need of this hypothesis. This is what encouraged, of course, the great revolution of getting rid of the Bible and not believing in the Bible and the story of creation. So it's interesting that indeed when Hubble came along, he well knew, of course, what Napoleon Bonaparte had received from Laplace, and so by the time in the early 1920s, a lot of astronomers had gotten to the place of ignoring the biblical record of creation. So in spite of the fact that it's right there in the Bible, and indeed it's so clear, it's one of the greatest blunders in the history of science, that the astronomers have gone this long, and it's just now that we're really challenging this whole issue about, you guys, you make out like you've got the truth and here the greatest truth of all time in astronomy and you're still trying to play games so to speak our God is in the heavens he has done whatsoever he has pleased the Lord has prepared his throne in the heavens his kingdom ruleth over all again God saying he has established his throne there in the heavens Amen. from ministry of healing page 419 in the heavens above in the earth in the broad waters of the ocean we see the handiwork of God all created things testify to his power, his wisdom, his love. 
Yet not from the stars or the ocean or the cataract can we learn of the personality of God as it was revealed in Christ. So as we present this afternoon this information, we keep this in mind. It is the essence of everything that we believe to learn of Jesus as revealed in the Bible. But Jesus has been in the business of revealing himself to us in the cosmos. So this is part of God's personality. David? God calls men to look upon the heavens, see him in the wonders of the starry heavens. We are not merely to gaze upon the heavens, we are to consider the works of God. He would have us study the works of infinity, and from this study to learn, and from this study, learn to love and reverence and obey him. The heavens and the earth with their treasures are to teach the lessons of God's love, care, and power. From Manuscript 96, year 1899. You know, we can't help but just emphasize a little bit of this. God calls men, me, David, to look upon the heavens to see him in the wonders of the starry heavens, which is what we've been talking about. These photographs today we saw of the Hubble Space Telescope. We are not merely to gaze upon the heavens. They're beautiful pictures of the cosmos. We are to consider the works of God. That's what we're talking about. How God was so involved in the creation for the purpose of eliminating us in the here and now. He would have us to study the works of infinity. And from this study to learn to love and reverence and obey him. Treasures to teach the lessons of God's love to us each one. Care and power David, and how little time and thought are given to the creator of the heavens and the earth. God calls upon his creatures to turn their attention from the confusion and perplexity around them and admire his handiwork. The heavenly bodies are worthy of contemplation. God has made them for the benefit of man. And as we study his works, angels will be by our side. It seems like to me here's a recommendation for at least a mini vacation. You know, this study has works. Angels will be by our side. I want to tell you, I, I want to study more and more and more. That guarantees me that as we look into God's work of creation, as we're doing here this afternoon even, there are unseen angels here. Thank the Lord. There are unseen angels here that we just cannot see. They're in this other dimension. But in a sense, a real sense, according to these words, we are being drawn closer to the God of heaven by even contemplating the creation of the universe and his bodies and to admire his handiwork. They're worthy of our contemplation. I mean, there's some magnificent thoughts here that should bring us closer, closer to God. The sun and the moon were made by him. There is not a star that beautifies the heavens which he did not make. Nothing to do with Big Bang evolutionary theory. God himself made them each one. David? Jesus Christ, creator of all things. Jesus as the great creator of all things. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the light was the light of men. The psalmist bears witness. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. We want to continue to pray that God would, in his glory, power, help us to understand that indeed the heavens are declaring the glory of God. Now, David, this is really something significant in my opinion. Go ahead. Through the fourth commandment, the attention of men is called to the power of the infinite hand that placed the stars in the firmament. If they had obeyed this commandment, they would have worshipped God as they looked at the sun that rules the day and the moon which rules the night. I think this is a fantastic statement because, for example, we're not going to ask anyone to raise your hand, but when we showed these pictures of the starry heavens taken by the Hubble Space Telescope this morning, how many people automatically thought, well, sure, God made those in the fourth day, and only a few days later, later, the seventh day. The Sabbath then, these beauties of the heavens should do what? 
they're a memorial, so to speak. The Sabbath is a memorial to the creation of all these heavenly bodies, just like the Sabbath is a memorial to the creation of El Capitan and all the granites around the world. The Sabbath is also a memorial of all these beautiful, beautiful photographs of the universe. So I believe God wants us as Seventh-day Adventists to begin to proclaim to the world that indeed, instead of Big Bang this and Big Bang that and on and on and on, look folks, here we Seventh-day Adventists believe that indeed, according to the Bible, God created all these in six days and that the memorial of it all, the Sabbath rest, is a memorial of all this. So the word needs to get out of the granite rocks. Sabbath being a memorial of the creation of the granite. Sabbath being a memorial of the creation of all the stars in the universe. That's my view. If you believe really that the power of God placed the stars in the firmament, you have to, you have to ask yourself the question, are the stars of the firmament just the planets in the solar system? Or does that include the, enti the entire starry host that can be seen with the Hubble Space Telescope? I think a lot of people, when they think about that, they're kind of drawn back in, in awe and amazement, and they think, you know, that's too much. That's too much for God to create on day four. You know, he just created this little tiny earth on day one. That's enough right there. In fact, a lot of people can't even believe that much. But then when you throw in the entire starry host on day four, that gets to be a little overwhelming. But I think if you really think about the power of God, that really, there's, a, there's other statements, there's another statement by um, Ellen White, which we, I guess we don't have it, but anyway, it says, if God were to, if all the stars were to be swept away in a moment, don't you think that God could again call them back into existence exactly the way he did in a, in a, in a moment, the way he did to begin with? And I guess the essence of that statement is, is that if all the stars were swept away in a moment, God could call them all back in a moment, just like he did when he first called them into existence. So I think that uh, there's no limit to the power of God in calling all the stars into existence. And as far as the starlight being too far away from us in order for us to see the stars by the time, you know, it's only 6,000 years and we're seeing starlight from so far away, I don't think there's really a problem with that either, personally. Um, during the creation of the stars, during the creation of the light itself, God is not subject to his own, he's not going to be restrained by his own physical, the laws which he himself created, the speed of light or whatever else. He's not hampered by that uh, physical law. So I think that, uh, you know, anytime we try to say, you know, there's no way God could have done that, we're limiting really the power of God. So I think that before we limit the power of God, we just give give the Bible a chance to explain itself and to believe it. Doesn't mean that we don't believe anything existed prior to creation week. We've already talked about that. I don't want to hear anybody say, don't you think that other worlds existed prior to creation week? Because we do. But those worlds, the ancient heavens, were not necessarily a part of the creation event. So, the visible universe, the visible universe, the, star, the, the stars that we can see with our eyes, the stars that we can see with the telescopes, that part of the universe, I think, is not too much for God to call into existence. And I know that, you know, people are going to disagree with that. But personally, I think that, um, you know, there's a lot in the Bible that you have to take on faith. And this would definitely be one of those things um, that you'd have to take on faith. The heavenly bodies are worthy down there about three-fourths of the way down. Heavenly bodies are worthy of contemplation. God has made them for the benefit of man. The thought just occurred to me. <clears throat> you know, we all pass through very difficult circumstances in life from time to time. Could it be that one of the things that God created these planets for, because, I mean, these stars for, the galaxies, Hubble Space Telescope photographs and everything, is to remind us, wait a minute, whatever the problems we have here, as you're pointing out, God called all these into existence in a fraction of a second, so to speak, instant creation. And the God who put these stars in the universe, certainly in calling them all into existence, the power he exercised there was infinite power. He certainly has enough power to do and deal with any problem that we may have in this life. 
This is so interesting. David, go ahead. Testimonies, Volume 2, page 583. He set apart that special day for man to rest from his labor, that as he should look upon the earth beneath and the heavens above, we've read this before, right? He might reflect that God made all these in six days. That God made all these, all these in six days. So in other words, when you think about that statement, if you really, you know, believe in that statement, when you look at the earth beneath, when you look at the heavens above, can you really differentiate and say, well, when you look at the heavens above, really all she meant by that was Jupiter, Saturn, Mars, the moon. Now all the stars that we see, those don't count. No, it sounds like to me that you, when you look up into the heavens above, it's everything that you can see. All the heavens, all the starry hosts that you can see. And that God made all these in six days. What about this, David? If we go out and walk on uh, some of the granite rocks that went up to El Capitan, and, you know, the earth beneath and the heavens above, doesn't that tell us, in addition to the fourth commandment, that indeed, six days, it's all that was given. And there it was. That's what the polonium halos tell us. That's what the Bible tells us. So, um, anyway, day unto day utter a speech. Night unto night showeth knowledge. No place, no speech, nor language where their voice is not heard. Our daughter just brought us a report of uh, someone who was a Messiah warrior over there in the midst of Africa, the darkness and darkness of Africa. How in the world did he ever become a Seventh-day Adventist minister? You know, that's the uh, group over there that headhunters and all that sort of thing. But he came out of that great darkness of headhunting and cannibalism and everything else to become a Seventh-day Adventist minister. And how did it happen to begin with? He looked at the heavens. He said, how did all that happen? And beginning there, God began to lead and lead and lead and guide. And he came into all the great truths that we understand in the Bible. Just by looking at the stars. Well, that's how it started. <laughs> that's what we got through saying. It's God. And basically, you look up there and the Holy Spirit is able to impress people that don't know anything about God. That indeed there has to be a creator. Creator has given abundant evidence that his power is unlimited. He holds the world by the word of his power. That's an interesting statement. Why don't you continue? He made the night, marshalling the shining stars in the firmament. He calls them all by name. Wait a minute. How in the world could he have a name for all of those stars? He's infinite. That's too many, right? You can't have a name for all those. Nobody could remember that much. He calls them all by name. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork, showing men that this little world is but a jot in God's creation. David, you know what just occurred to me as you were reading that? About God uh, having a name for all the stars and there are trillions of them out there. What Jesus said about people in this world. He said, you know, sparrows don't even fall without your father noticing it. And he also says the minute detail of each person he even knows who you, not only who you are, but how many hairs you have. Just the detailed knowledge of the infinite God throughout the universe for every one of us. Okay, yet the works of the Creator testify of God's power and greatness. David? The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. From Psalm 19.1. The invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, Romans 1.20. This the is invisible. all quotes from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 116. It says the invisible things of him from the creation of the world. There are a lot of things that we can't see. We can't see God's power working per se. Uh, and anyway, it's this invisible power of God working. Everyone today, as we all know, wants to see things happen. We want to see it visually. But indeed, there's something behind the scenes, the working of the Holy Spirit, the mighty omnipotent power that comes into each life as we pray for God through Christ to dwell within us. David? <clears throat> High Calling, page 193. Behold the glories of the firmament. Look up to the gems of light, which like precious gold stud the heavens. 
Yeah, this is it. Cannot he who spread above us this glorious canopy, in other words, the first part of the saying, saying Jesus is the one who spread above us this glorious canopy, who, if the sun, moon, and stars were swept away, okay, imagine that just for a minute, just stop right there and imagine the sun, the moon, and the stars being swept away. David, you mean everything in the universe, Hubble Space Telescope photographs and everything, right? Everything, gone everything completely gone, then what? Could call them into existence in a million years. Could again call. Could uh, call them again into existence in a million years. No. <laughs> in a moment. Could call them again into existence in a moment. So, the way that seems to be phrased to me, and this is what I was trying to remember a minute ago, of course, was that there is a very clear indication from this statement that the creation of this visible universe, whether we can wrap our minds around it or not, I don't claim to, to understand it myself, happened in an instant. I don't, I don't know, I don't see how that's possible. But if they were all swept away, could call them again. He did it, he did it the first time. He could do it again into existence in a moment. That's one of the most fantastic statements I think I've ever read. As you say, we're finite. God is infinite. But he's giving us an insight into the power just calling one world into existence or one planetary system or one galaxy of 100, trillion, 100 billion stars but now have a trillion galaxies with all the stars and everything associated with them swept away and as you say called in again into existence in a moment I can't comprehend it either but I know it's true I know, you know it's true. I don't think that there's any way that you can say that this doesn't correspond with what we also read in the Bible. Fourth day of, the, you know, it says it in the fourth, um, in the fourth day of creation. That's right. He made the greater light and the lesser light. He made the stars also. It's true. The biblical language doesn't, you know, say glorious canopy, sun, moon, and stars swept away, could call them again into existence in a moment. It doesn't say that. It just says... He made the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars. You know, these are just statements of fact. And people, you know, can't wrap their minds around that. But these statements tend to capture your imagination a little bit and give you an insight that what we're reading in the Bible, what we literally read in the Bible, is literally true. God literally spoke these celestial objects into existence as he did the earth in a moment. You know, in my opinion, David, uh, one of the reasons why the Lord gave the gift of this prophecy, of course, of the prophetic office to Ellen White, is so as we approach the end time, and I think we're in the end time, as we approach the second coming of Christ, the Lord must have seen that indeed uh, our minds, in order to escape the corruptions in the world and the theories of this and that and the other, and the atheistic theories, that there is an illumination that perhaps would be beneficial for us, and I know it's been beneficial for me, to read these passages and to see that indeed this enlarged um, understanding, if I want to put it that way. So I think I'm thankful to the God of heaven for him actually giving Ellen G. White the gift of prophecy, and then not only the gift of prophecy, generally speaking, but for him to have spoken to Ellen White, for her to be able to put down these statements, for us to be able to read and have us really basically re-inspired again this afternoon to see how great God, how Jesus Christ really is. All right, David, we're going down to the open space in Ohio. We read this this morning, early writings, page 41. I believe this is, like I said this morning, the only place that this is mentioned right. in all of the writings of Ellen White. You've got tons of 6,000-year statements, tons of 4,000-year statements, one Orion statement. Dark, heavy clouds came up and clashed against each other. The atmosphere parted and rolled back. Then we could look up through the open space in Orion, whence came the voice of God. The holy city will come down through that open space. 
You know, as I said this morning, we have this uh, DVD, The Center of the Universe. For those of you who are interested at all, you'll be really interested in getting that one. Or if you just want to go online, halos.com, you don't have to buy it. But we have this trip from Earth going through the Orion Nebula to the throne and then coming back again through this open space in Orion. Fantastic. We've had people all over the place who watch that DVD and how inspired they become by watching the animation of going to and coming back of Christ at the second coming. I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel. What we're talking about today is really part of a major part of the everlasting gospel. To preach unto them that dwell on the earth to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people saying with a loud voice, Fear God, give glory to him for the hour's judgment has come. Worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters, which is what we've been doing. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So what we've been talking about, the God of heaven is affirming through these statements and through the scientific work that we've been presenting that indeed this is exactly true. David, what are we facing here in these days? Between the laws of men and the precepts of Jehovah will come the last great conflict of the controversy between truth and error. Upon this battle we are now entering, a battle not between rival churches contending for the supremacy, but between the religion of the Bible and the religions of fable and tradition. The agencies which have united against truth are now actively at work. God's holy word, which, is, which was handed down to us at so great a cost of suffering and bloodshed, is little valued. There are few who really accept it as the rule of life. Infidelity prevails to an alarming extent, not only, not in the world only, but in the church. Many have come to deny doctrines which are the very pillars of the Christian faith. The great facts of creation, as presented by the inspired writers, the fall of man, the atonement, the perpetuity of the law, these all are practically rejected by a large share of the professedly Christian world. The great facts of creation, that's what we're told is one of the great pillars of our faith. That's what we're here for, to try to help everyone to understand that indeed those pillars are standing firm. They aren't moving anywhere. Even though it says, of course, these are all practically rejected by a large share of the professedly Christian world, we know that's true. That's why we as some of the Adventists sometimes have great difficulty reaching our friends in the other churches, Catholic, Methodist, Presbyterian, whatever it may happen to be, because they have, they have been taught to believe that indeed the great facts of creation are not really facts at all. They're simply fairy tales of one kind or another. Plus the fact, you see, David, we've uh, talked about this before, that is that scientists today, especially physicists, are looked upon by the people of the world, ordinary people, lay people, as the gods. They say, the physicists say, we understand the Big Bang, we've developed here, developed there, we've got all this evidence for it. So they, have, they are the modern day gods that people have looked to. So when you read something in the newspaper or whatever magazine, it's always within the context of its astronomy, the Big Bang. But that's exactly what this is saying. That people are rejecting the great issues of creation, the flaw of creation and so forth, because of this blasphemy, so to speak, should I say, that's going on in the world under the guise of science. David? But the infidel supposition that the events of the first week required seven vast indefinite periods for their accomplishment strikes directly at the foundation of the Sabbath of the fourth commandment. It is the worst kind of infidelity, for with many who profess to believe the record of creation, it is infidelity in disguise. Infidel geologists claim that the world is very much older than the Bible record makes it. They reject the Bible record because of those things which are to them evidences from the earth itself that the world has existed tens of thousands of years. And of course now these days tens of thousands of years has turned into billions of years. At that time when she was alive People thought the earth was tens of thousands of years old. And many who profess, reading on now, and many who profess to believe the Bible 
record are at a loss to account for wonderful things which are found in the earth. Things like what? Maybe polonium halos? <laughs> With the view that creation week was only seven literal days and that the world is now only about 6,000 years old. From Spiritual Gifts, Volume 3, page 91 and 92. There you have it. This isn't the only 6,000 year statement. There's many, many, and there's many 4,000 year statements. You've got to throw away all of those statements. You have to say that she was wrong, 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 not only one time, but two times, three times, four times, 10 times, 20 times. You have to say she was wrong at least 20 or 30 times in order to really get rid of the 6,000 year age of the earth. And the 6,000 year age of the earth is in essence based upon biblical chronology, at least one biblical chronology, which is an approximate age from the time of creation, well, which gives an approximate date for the time of creation. Nobody knows exactly when that was, but you can approximate it. So I think that it is safe to say that the earth, earth is about 6,000 years old. People come to me and they say, that's date setting. If you're, if, if you're saying that the great controversy lasts 6,000 years and the earth is now about 6,000 years old, that's date setting. Well, I don't agree with that. I don't think that's date setting. But it is something that can come into our consciousness and we can know for a certainty that we are very close to the end of time. David, thinking about what you just said, it's good you said that because we want to clarify there's nothing as far as David and I are concerned that tells us for sure that the world is going to end at 6,000 years. Right. That is an inference that other people make. We don't make that. So when we say that these messages, these passages are referring to an approximate 6,000 year age of the earth, that's what they are. They are saying that very plainly. At the same time, we do not say that we know for sure, nor is there any Bible or even spirit of prophecy statement, to the effect that it's going to end at exactly 6,000 years. There's no basis for saying that. The only thing that people, the only way people make that inference is when she says that the great controversy has been active for 6,000 years. So people do from that make an inference that the end of the world or the end of the great controversy happens at around 6,000 years. But regardless of that, even if you take that statement into consideration, that still is not date setting. And there is just no way around it absolutely no way that you can get any kind of a date out of these statements. Absolutely not. And the very best you can do is just give, say, an approximation that we are near the end. We believe the Holy Spirit actually spoke to Ellen G. White and she wrote in the same way that the Bible writers did. They were inspired as the Holy Spirit spoke to them. So when David and I read these passages, we want you to understand that we believe that God spoke gave her the thought, and she put it down in her own words. That's but, not verbal inspiration, but it is thought inspiration. That's right. And I don't care how matter, no matter how you cut it, the thought of 6,000 year statements cannot be misinterpreted 20 or 30 times over and over and over again. That's the bottom line. You cannot throw out all of those 6,000 year statements. So if you come in here or go to a, somewhere else and they say, well, you know, the Egyptian chronologies basically mandate that the earth is at least 10,000 years old. So we, we have to believe that, you know. The earth is at least 10,000 years old. No, you don't have to believe that. You don't have to accept somebody that tells you the Egyptian chronologies force us to believe that the earth is 10,000 years old. The Egyptians don't make us believe anything, by the way. We make ourselves believe what we want to. So, I, I mean... Let me follow up on what you just said. Why do we give the Egyptians so much credit? <laughs> Let me follow up on that. Uh, we talked about this a little bit before. The Egyptians, you're bringing out a very, very good point. Who are the Egyptians? Let's uh, present this analogy. We had a president some 30 years ago or more by the name of Richard Nixon. Now, at the time he was in office, he said, no, 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 I didn't do anything. And finally, of course, it was exposed. But now suppose, instead of being just president, he was dictator like the pharaohs in Egypt. And afterwards, you know, he wrote his memoirs and so forth. If he had been, if he had the power that one of the Egyptian pharaohs had when he wrote those memoirs, 
What do you think the memoirs would have said? Nothing about him being guilty of anything. So what we're saying is, you got people who are atheists. They were not Christians, the Egyptian pharaohs. They didn't have any religion at all except some heathen religion. So on what basis would you think that indeed they would be telling the truth? What we know for sure is, what are all those pyramids over there? Who's buried in those pyramids? The pharaohs. In other words, it was, you know, I'm going to beat the last pharaoh. I'm going to have a bigger pyramid. I'm going to have this. Now I'm going to, I don't think it's any question in my mind. They were telling the historians, look, guys, you know, when you write the history of my reign here, you're going to make sure you make it more than the previous pharaoh. And it went on like this and went on like this. I mean, how in the world? Truth, truth, truth comes only by what? The inspiration of God. You don't have any people back there who are believing in God of heaven. They're writing whatever they want to write to exalt themselves. It's no puzzle at all that the Egyptian chronology should extend further, much, much further than the biblical record. We have an enemy in this world that's called the devil. And he's inspiring all the people under him to write all sorts of things and do all sorts of things to presumably call into question what? The words of the Bible. It's very simple what's been going on about Egyptian chronology. What surprises me is that people don't see through all of that and recognize that indeed where's a little bit of truth here a little bit of truth there they take a little bit of truth here a little bit of truth there and then throw away all the error and just say well indeed you know it's got to be true as you were saying let me return to this uh, infidel geologist claim the world is very much older than the bible record makes it infidel that's a pretty bad that's a pretty significant you know denotation of someone character infidel is anyone here today? We don't want to get, go too far on this, but the very fact of the matter is that in people who say it's much older than the Bible record makes it, she's making it very, very plain here. In that last statement, it's only about 6,000 well, years by old. Well, by inference there, she says that the world is very much older than the Bible record makes it. What's the indirect inference there? The indirect inference is that the Bible record makes it something. That's right. Right? And She's saying it's making it older than the Bible record makes it. By, by, well, by default, you have to accept that, well, the Bible record does make the Earth's age something. An approximation, right? The last and, statement. Um, you know. And the last statement there in the world, the world is now, she's telling us, the Lord is telling her, it is only about 6,000 years old. That's what the Bible record makes it. David, let's uh, go back here just a minute on something you and I know about. And, probably no one else in the audience knows anything about. I had a friend over in South Africa, as you remember, about 30 years ago now. He wrote me and he was delving into biblical genealogies. And he wrote these long, long, long treatises, so to speak, in one or two booklets we have at home, going into extremely great detail about the genealogies of the Bible. And indeed, I think he came very, very close, if not exact, in arriving at the actual point of origin in terms of a date. So I think that indeed this man being led of God, some of the Adventists who had prayed and prayed and prayed diligently about it, uh, and no one was able to find anything in the world wrong with the chronology that he was developing there. He was actually killed in an automobile accident later and so it never came to very much attention. But I think from the standpoint of you and myself, that as we read that material and studied it, myself especially, I could see that indeed this reference to 6,000 years or approximate that is really based on the biblical record if you sit down and study it very, very carefully. Now, from that standpoint then, this is, well, we've got another statement we want to bring out and I'll comment on it when we do that. This is the statement you were referring to, David. The great controversy between Christ and Satan that has been carried forward for nearly 6,000 years is soon to close. And the wicked one redoubles his efforts to defeat the work of Christ in man's behalf and to fasten <laughs> souls in his snares, to hold the people in darkness and in penitence till no Savior's mediation is ended, until the, until the Savior's mediation is ended. And there is no longer a sacrifice for sin is the object which he seeks to accomplish. Well, to hold people in darkness till there is no longer a sacrifice for sin. We're here today to try to communicate as much light as we possibly can. This first sentence there, David, doesn't that really stand out? Because now it is simply not a reference to the age of the earth. It's a reference to what? 
the time that the great controversy has been called, uh, started there in heaven. Now let's pick up on that. Great controversy between Christ and Satan has been carried forward for nearly 6,000 years, is soon to close. Earlier as we talked about this, we found what in terms of what was going on in heaven? We found that indeed the great controversy started in heaven, day six of creation week. And that's when the 6,000 year period began. So it's got to include then everything on the earth at that particular point. But it's so clear that indeed here, it's the great controversy between Christ and Satan. It's simply not age per se of the earth that includes that. But this statement to me is extremely interesting. Now, there's another interesting thing about this statement. It says nearly 6,000 years, but that was written approximately and published, you know, about 1910. It's 100 years later almost. Could it be possible that the more than 6,000 year, well, 6, year period has actually been encountered and met, and now we're on the other side of 6,000 years? That's a possibility. It's possible that now today, whereas 100 years ago it was nearly 6,000 years, it's possible that today it's more than 6,000 years. That's we, a we don't know for sure. We don't know for sure. But we're simply saying that indeed that is a possibility. It was nearly 100 years ago. We don't know what it is right now, but that certainly is a definite possibility that the world right now is older than 6,000 years. Just wanted to bring this out to help everyone to understand we're not focusing on 6,000 years per se right. at the time that uh, we're talking tonight. We did not follow colorly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty for when we received honor and glory from God the Father and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. We heard this voice born from heaven for we with him, with him on the holy mountain. God was affirming to the disciples that were going to be going to the world by giving them that vision on the Mount of Transfiguration. What we're saying is God, the Father in heaven, affirmed through tangible evidence of taking those disciples to the top of the Mount of Transfiguration and revealing Christ in his glory. So what we're saying is faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But faith does have a substance. True faith has substance to it that is truth. And just as Jesus provided the disciples, of course, with that experience there on the Mount of Transfiguration, we believe that God has provided this, these fingerprints of creation in the earth and in the cosmos to help us provide for what is coming upon the earth. In the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundation of the earth. The heavens are the work of your hands. Indeed, the foundations of the earth, what? The granite rocks, the created rocks and the heavens are the work of your hands. Tells us there is a synchronism between the creation of the granite rocks and the heavens on day four. So, David? Job 38, four, six, and seven. Where were you when I laid earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand on what were its footings set or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. Here again, like this morning, we saw that indeed there were representatives, there were people, there were angels, of course, looking at what was going on in creation itself. And then there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, that's Genesis 6, 4. And we find the human bones again, the giant human fragments there. Uh, Dr. Van Connorswald, David, you want to take over here and describe just a little bit? We saw it this morning. Right. This is just, of course, the sketch of the photograph that you see in Life magazine. And I recommend to you, if you're skeptical that this really exists in Life magazine, order the, ma order the magazine from an antiques magazine dealer. They've got them. This, this issue is not actually that hard to find. Uh, somebody that was a friend of mine, after seeing this um, presentation, decided to order uh, this magazine from an antiques magazine dealer in Atlanta and they easily were able to get them and in this magazine you can see the original pictures here the guy holding his giant jawbone we can by the way don't look at this molar here I mean maybe you can't tell that's a tooth but that's a tooth and he's holding the the the, the human tooth in between his fingers here and then the giant tooth over here and obviously the, these are drawings but in the mag in the original magazine they're photographs. And, you know, people can say, well, that's just a hoax, you know. And true, maybe a lot of hoaxes have been made in paleontology and a lot of fabrications and fraud. But when something is found which fits 
the biblical record, it doesn't automatically make it true, but you at least need to take notice. Uh, you know, there's some, anyway, we don't need to go on and on about that, but at least you need to take notice of it, investigate it. I think it's worth that. Yeah, what we have here are the sketches, very, very faithful sketches of what the figures are, pictures are in Life magazine. The reason I didn't scan and actually show those is because of a copyright issue. This is something that was a sketch, a very, very faithful sketch of what is there in the magazine itself. The new giant appears on man's family tree. And again, the size of the human jawbone over there on the left and the giant one over there on the right. And again, the picture, the presumed picture of what the giant looked like. That's Noah on the left. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> and of course, the giant on the left and the presumed size of the human today on the right. And now, spiritual gifts, David. Spiritual gifts, volume 3, page 84. Those who lived before the flood come forth with their giant-like stature, more than twice as tall as men now living on the earth and well-proportioned. In other words, they're not just, they're not like a, a string bean that's, you know, 12 feet tall. They're actually proportioned to their height, which is what we would expect. But to me, it's interesting. The antediluvians, more than twice the height of men now living. Now this is also the sketch from the page there in Life magazine in David. You can see, go ahead, in other words, they took the bones of the giant fragments of the jawbone and other things and they pictured, this is now what the evolutionist Life magazine people did. They pictured that man in the center. You know, the man on the left, I understand. And the giant, I understand. But who's that little guy up there on the right? Proconsul ape. I don't know what that is. Probably some poor child, you know, that never grew up. I don't know. But anyway, you know, but anyway the bottom line is, is that, you know, you have the giants, you have modern man, you have these other... Uh, anyway, it fits along with the more than twice the size or thereabouts, doesn't it, that we just got through reading? Twice the size as men now living. That's pictured there in Life magazine if you go and look at it. Okay. God who gives life to the dead calls into existence the things that do not exist. That's what we've spoken of many, many times. By the Lord, by the Lord, by the heavens made, the host of them, by the breath of his mouth. Spake it was done, he commanded, and it stood fast. By faith we understand the world was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was made out of things which did not appear. The work of creation can never be explained by science. We're not trying to explain how the creation occurred. We're simply saying, this is the evidence that shows did it. Go ahead. The theory that God, this is one of my favorite quotes for, for people who actually believe in the writings of Ellen White. If you don't believe in the writings of Ellen White, just, this is not for you. But if you do, this is interesting. The theory that God did not, did not, create matter when he brought the world into existence, okay, the theory, is without foundation. And what does that mean? It means that it is without foundation. It's not true. In the formation of our world, God was not indebted to pre-existing matter. In my way of thinking, he wasn't indebted to it. He created the matter. On the contrary, in other words, he didn't, he wasn't indebted to create, to pre-existing matter. He didn't, and this is, these are my words, he didn't use pre-existing matter. On the contrary, all things, material or spiritual, stood up before the Lord Jehovah at his voice. That should be correlated with Psalm 33, 6 and 9. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made. Okay? That correlates with Psalm 33, 6 and 9. On the contrary, all things material or spiritual stood up before the Lord Jehovah at his voice and were created for his own purpose. The heavens and all the host of them, the earth and all things therein, are not only the work of his hand, 
they came into existence by the breath of his mouth. Again, the writings of Ellen White, that's from volume 8 of the Testimonies, page 258 and 259. To me, that's just an illustration, that just is an amplification of what we already read in the Bible in Psalm 33, 6 and 9. It's not adding to the Bible, I don't think. It's clarifying. It's, it's um, giving more information about what the Bible is already telling us. When the foundations of the earth were laid, when the mountains, morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy, there was laid the foundation of the Sabbath. As we said this morning, there was no Sabbath before creation, the creation of this particular universe. The six days, the six literal days, they're all just 24-hour days, not half of one day being billions and billions of years old. So the foundations of the earth and the foundation of the Sabbath was laid at the same time. We can see this little schematic here. Uh, day one, that's indeed basically the foundations of the earth at that particular time. And the Sabbath days, seven days later, there's the Sabbath. The earth is as only as old as the first Sabbath. The great God has reared his mighty structures in the granite rocks, towering mountains in the clefts, the gulches, gulches in the gorges, and the castle rocks in the caves of the earth. Structures in the granite rocks. There are several times in which the granite rocks are mentioned. As the earth came forth from the hand of its maker, it was exceedingly beautiful. Its surface was diversified with mountains, hills, plains interspersed with noble rivers and lovely lakes. But the mountains, hills and mountains were not abrupt and rugged, abounding in terrific steeps and frightful chasms as they do now. The sharp, ragged edges of Earth's rocky framework. What have we said over and over again? The granites are the Part foundations of the, framework. of the Earth. We're buried beneath the fruitful soil which everywhere produced the luxuriant growth of azure. After the Earth with its teeming animal and vegetable life, as David had just said, had been called into existence, man, the crowning work of the Creator, was brought upon the stage of action. So, why are we seeing El Capitan today and not covered with, you know, a lot of soil and beauty and so forth? It was what? All washed away at the time of the flood. What? Time of the flood. There, David, the records of creation. When the veil that darkens our vision shall be removed, and our eyes shall behold that world of beauty which we now catch glimpses through the microscope. When we look on the glories of the heavens, now scanned afar through the telescope. When the blight of sin removed, the whole earth shall appear in the beauty of the Lord our God. What a field will be open to our study. There the student of science may read the records of creation and discern no reminders of the law of evil. That's from Education, page 303. I want to suggest that indeed, that if the records of creation are going to be there in the new earth, that the records of creation are just as visible in the present earth, which is what we've been talking about. Well, that brings us to the end of our presentation today, our official presentation, the formal presentation. We will entertain for a period of time questions. <laughs>